you pray for your country, there are some evil, evil forces. It's biblical. What I'm, what I'm telling you is biblical. Principalities, powers, those are all areas of authority. Wherever there is authority, there is a spiritual force and a physical earthly force working in coordination with spirit. The spirits are always working to destroy wherever biblical authority is. Biblical authority is the Bible. Biblical authority is the husband over a family or the law, the constitution over our nation. That is, believe it or not, that's biblical authority. God establishes that. It's the rule of law. And we've got, we've got hundreds, if not thousands of politicians in this country that no longer concern themselves with what is right for America. They concern themselves with doing shady deals behind and being protected by the media instead of being exposed by them. Shady deals that line their own pockets. And I'm sick of it. I've had it. And um, my, my suspicion is that he's sniffed out a lot of those shady deals and they hate him for it. They're scared of him. He was never meant to be in office. They thought they had Hillary, who is, who is the most crooked, dirty, dealing, lying sack of potatoes that's ever been in politics, ever. She is Jezebel and her husband's Ahab. And um, I don't listen. I don't apologize for saying that. That's if I had made up my mind, if she, she would be president, I was going to push against her every day. And uh, there was a guy that used to go to this church when Hillary was going to run the first time back in 08. I just was kidding around with him. And I said, you can vote for Hillary. He turned around. And he said, oh, yes, I would. That did not sit well with me. So he does not go to church here anymore. I didn't run him out. He just left. He didn't, he didn't like what I said. So, but I'm, I'm sick of dirty politics. I'm sick of, the, I'm sick of the, the, the war we fight is with the devils and the spirits behind these things. And our weapons of warfare are not carnal. They're spiritual. Pray. We stand strong in the word of God. Amen. And uh, ready to go to battle at any, at any moment. But the battle is spiritual. Always keep that in mind. All right. Where in the world do we want to go? Turn to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. I got a lot, lot to say this morning. So Galatians 4 verse 1. Paul says... Um, now I say that the heir, and I want you to think about the inheritance. Heaven is an inheritance. It is given to you by way of the second birth. Just as because you are born of an earthly father and mother, the inheritance would go to you when, when your mom and dad pass on, the inheritance goes to you. It's the same way. We are heirs to eternal life. It is an inheritance given to us. It is not given to us by our merits. It is not given to us that one is better than the other. It's given to us because we are sons of God by way of being born again. So that's how you think of it. That the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. And you think about what that means. So let's say, let's say your daddy uh, owns the majority stock in Walmart. Okay? Sam Walton raised his children up and taught them his business. And they took over the business when he, when he passed on. And they're running different things. Um, so that family is very heavily involved still in, in Walmart, Sam Walton's business. But while they were little, they had to go to school like everybody else went to school. I'm sure Mrs. Walton gave them a whipping whenever they got out of line and they had to have a whipping. We, right now, 
as children differeth nothing from servants, though we be Lord of all, we are, we are going to reign with Jesus Christ one of these days, but as under tutors, verse 2, as under tutors and governors, until the time appointed of the Father, everything that happens to you in life, is a way that God is teaching you something that you need to know. Every good experience and every bad experience. Okay? It's training us. It's teaching us. Now, if you've been in that training for a while, you don't fold near as easily as you would have when you first got in. So I've mentioned this. It's like being in the military. When you first show up, get off that bus at basic training... They're going to walk all over you the first week. And you're going to wish you had never been born. But after that, they're strengthening you and they're teaching you. And then in turn, some years later, you in turn are able then to teach others as they're coming up. That's how it works. So right now we're under tutors and governors. You always going to be in school. Always going to be in school. Always learning something new. God's always going to show you something. Until the time appointed of the Father. Time appointed of the Father is either at our death or the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ in the air. So verse 3, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Now, I'm going to unhook my train here just for a minute and teach you a little bit about the, t to me, there's two religions in the world. Only two. There's Bible-believing Christianity, and the opposite of that is any form of witchcraft. Any form. And it comes in a multitude of forms. Uh, Todd, I'm going to use you for an example. When you got saved and started coming here, you brought me big box of books. Okay. They were books on the occult, things that he had gathered and things that he was studying. Now, they were all different realms and different types, but they were essentially the same. Because basically, who's the head of all the cults and all the paganism, all the new age, all the witchcraft? Who's the head of all that? It's Satan. It's Lucifer. They worship and serve him, whether they even believe in him or not, they do it. And in, in these religions, part of their religious force that they say governs the universe are what they call the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, okay? And believe it or not, if you know what to look for, you can see those four symbols everywhere. When I take Lisa up to her doctor... Uh, it's a it's an office of St. John's Mercy or the, or the Mercy Deal. In this big office, they got four big circles designing the wall, and they're all four different colors, and I know what those colors are. They are earth, air, fire, and water. And if you think about it, those are replacements for what we believe in. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're the exact opposite of the gospel. Witchcraft says you must perform. Bible Christianity says Jesus has already performed. He's already done it. Amen? Amen. And that, that's where our trust is. Witchcraft says you must say the spell right. You must face in these four directions, north, south, east, and west. You must worship on the, the two equinoxes and the two solstices. So there's absolutely no doubt yesterday was the 21st which is the winter solstice, and I guarantee you there were pagan, wicked festivals everywhere around the world because they believed that they must do certain rituals on these four days. And notice in verse 3 of your Bible, Galatians 4, verse 3, even so when we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. The word elements is mentioned four times in your Bible. Four times. And what he's saying here is, think of the... The guardians of those powers, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. Those are our four enemies. So it's four gospels against four groups of spirits. In Daniel chapter 2, 
when Nebuchadnezzar had the dream and he woke up, he couldn't remember the dream. He didn't even know what the interpretation was. He called into his astrologers, his soothsayers, his magicians, and his Chaldeans. He called four groups of advisors to him who practiced occult divination to tell him what his dream was. And they said, oh, we can't do that. And he said, if you don't tell me what the dream was, I'll think you're lying through your teeth the whole time and I won't have your head cut off. So watch this. In the same chapter, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went to prayer, asked God, God, show us the, show us the dream. And they prayed one time, God showed them the dream. Four against four. And God's four always wins. Amen? Amen. Okay? So now I'm going to hook this back up. Now verse 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God is always about timing. Always. When a woman is carrying a baby, there is a time for that baby to be delivered. That's the fullness of time. And so we have in 1 Thessalonians 5, where he said, the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night, but when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them as travail upon a woman with child. So when the woman travails, the water comes forth, that's the fullness of time. The baby is now ready to be delivered. And so you get this, this idea that that's how it is. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son. And where did he do it? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The four books that give us the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth the Son made of a woman, made under the law. So Christ came in the form, human form. He was fully human and he was fully God. He was not half and half. He was all human. And he was all God. I don't understand it, but I believe it. Okay? It was, the, it was the man, the fully man, that was crying out in the Garden of Gethsemane. But it was fully God who rose again on the third day, defeating, conquering death. Amen. So, he's made under the law, verse 5, to redeem them that were under the law. That is, you and I, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So you and I grafted in, adopted in, who were not, we were not uh, people of Israel. We did not come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the 12 tribes. We did not stem from them. We, come, we are sinners of the heathen Gentiles. And yet God has brought us in, adoption of sons, and verse 6, and because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. This is the reception of the Holy Ghost, what they call the baptism of the Holy Ghost. If you, if you do not have living inside of you the Spirit of God's Son crying, Abba, Father, you are not saved. You can be religious. You can be a member of a church. You can be baptized by sprinkling or immersion or whatever, or both of them. You can have a 20-year straight Sunday school attendance pin. You can have a record of tithing that goes back the last 30 years. You can put on religious clothing. You can put on a religious mindset. You can be a member of a church and die and split hell wide open. You can have that. But unless the Spirit of God's Son dwells in you to where God is no longer some distant entity that you are don't know anything about and you cannot approach Him, he is as close to you as you crying. And here's the word, Abba. Think about a little child. Does not know how to say words like sesquicentennial and Mississippi. And doesn't know how to say adversarial. And doesn't know how to say subtle. And all that child can say is cry out to his mother and his father. But he doesn't call him mother and father. The simplest words that can be formed from a baby's mouth. Mama. Dada. But in Hebrew, Abba. And that word, Abba. Yes, it means father. But it means I'm like really his son. And I recognize, even from the youngest age, I recognize 
and this, this makes liberals mad, there is a difference between a father and a mother. One is a different gender than the other. Um, I just read, I think it was American Airlines or United Airlines, one of them, is no longer going to ask you when you fill out the form to get a ticket, they're going to include transgendered language now. You can be male, female, or other. Now, uh-uh. If you were born a male, you're a male. You're born female, you're female. Amen. It's determined in your chromosomes. It's in your DNA who you are. Okay? So anyway, but God is our Abba. We recognize him even as children in God. We don't know anything, and yet we know who our Abba is. Because God's spirit, it's the spirit of his son in us that gets us to recognize who God is in our relationship. I've said this before. I went to Bible college. I studied theology, but I didn't really learn God until I started having children of my own. Then I went, now wait a minute. This is my child. Even though they've done wrong and they don't do anything for themselves, I love them, so I'm going to feed them. I'll never forget the first night Lisa left me home by myself with Lindsay when she was a baby. I ended up running over to Gloria. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with this? Okay. But I, and I, I can remember she was crying. I couldn't get her to shut up. And finally I started acting goofy with her. And I can remember the first time she come out of that crying, she started laughing at daddy. I went, I got her now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Then I, I'm, I'm thinking, well, this is me. She's me. And I'm God. And I desire my children to love me. Amen. Those of you who have kids, you know that you want your children to love you. And they... You, in turn, you love them even before they love you. Isn't that how it is? Jesus loves me this I know, for the Bible tells me so. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So that's what that means. God sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Turn to Luke 15. Luke chapter 15. Here's the story. And I'm, you're, you can't look on the screen. Because it's too little. You have to get your Bible out. That's teaching your fingers how to do warfare. Your fingers turn the pages of the Bible. Luke 15, 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons. The young of them said to his father, give, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. See that? He's wanting the inheritance now. But what's, we know what he's going to do with it. He's a young boy. He's the younger brother. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Who's that sound like? Us. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine that land. And he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent into his fields to feed swine. Believe it or not, that is where the name Hoggard comes from. Hoggard. That's where our name came from. We were hog herders. Hog guards. So, uh, look at verse 16. He would have fain filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. Have you ever seen they give hogs? Hogs can eat the most rotten, disgusting, maggot-infested puke. They can eat that. How then does bacon taste so wonderful? No idea. Okay? But he is so hungry now. Listen to this. This is what God did to you. 
and He will do it again. God will make you hungry. But He was so hungry, He would have ate the puke that the swine were eating. He would have filled His belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And no man gave it to Him. When He came to Himself, this is where God wants you. He wants you in a position where nobody else is going to help you. But He will. God will harden everybody's heart around you. God will make sure that nobody, and I mean nobody, helped you. As parents, that's tough love. Because we know that if we keep giving to our children and keep and enable their sin and their rebellion, if we keep doing that, they're just going to keep going that way. We say we love them when we say, I'm not going to give you any more money. I'm not going to give you any food. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to bail you out. I'm going to let you suffer. Because it's the only, hunger is a great motivator. And God will let you get hungry. So hungry that you'll do anything. And so hungry, it'll change your mind. So he says, verse 17, he starts thinking about it. He says, when he came to himself, listen, look at this. It changed his mind. When he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger? My dad's slaves have it better than I've got it. So he says, I will arise, verse 18, and go to my father and said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. So he's got his heart right and his attitude is right. Attitude with God is everything. Because God is the one who knows your attitude. He's the one, you can fake it to everybody else. But God is the one who actually knows who's serious and who isn't. Because he judges the, and discerns the thoughts and intents of the human heart. There could be somebody who is acting like they are your best friend but their intentions are to make gain, some sort of gain out of you and then leave you dry. Who's ever had that happen to them? Sure you have. Okay? They used you to get what they wanted and boom, they're gone. And that's their intention. And God knows everybody's intentions. He judges. So, now look at, now look at the father though. And I always have this vision. When I think about this story, I see this, this young man gone for years. But every day that he's gone, his father walks out the front door, sitting on the porch, looking down the road, hoping and praying that his son will come back to him. Hoping every day, praying every day. If you have children that are lost, as long as you've got breath, you pray for them. As long as you've got a, a mind that works, even if you can't even hardly get out of bed during the day, you pray for those children. So he says, and, um, Let's see, verse 19, no more worthy to be called thy son, make me as one of thy hired servants. Verse 20, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, see, that's where I get this from. When he was a great way off, his father saw him. I think his dad went out every day looking for his son. Looking down the road. Is he coming today? Dad knows there's a famine. Dad knows his son. He knows he's got to be out of money by now. Where's my son? So he's a great way off and his father saw him and he had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. God went to him. Now the father could have said, 
the father could have said, I've already given you your portion. I have nothing left for you. That's what he could have said. But that's not what he said. And I'm going to give some advice. Lisa and I have talked about this. As our children have grown, got out on their own, every now and then they needed money. So Lisa and I would loan them money, ask them to pay it back. But I've, I've watched too many court cases on Judge Judy and everything else to see these parents dragging their own children into court, suing them over a loan that the children didn't pay back. I think that's a shame. And we decided we would never, ever, ever loan money to our children that we were going to sever the relationship if they didn't pay it back. Because how much did you owe God? How much did you owe God? And He sent His only begotten Son to pay off your debt. And God, here's Jesus. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And God forgave everybody that nailed Jesus to the cross. So that's advice for fathers and mothers, grandparents. If you loan it to family, don't ever put that money in front of family. Because God doesn't. The father ran to him and kissed him. Can you imagine the smell of a young man whose mama didn't tell him to bathe every night and he's been feeding hogs, living with swine. And he comes home smelling, but his father kissed him. And the son said, verse 21, Father, I have sinned against heaven in thy sight and no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. That robe is righteousness. We are clothed in the righteousness that God puts on us. Uh, and before, hey, before you put that robe on him, wash him down. Bring soap. Wash him down. They put, a, put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again and he was lost and is found and they began to be merry. That's us. We are no, we come begging to be a servant and yet God makes us a son. And if we are a son, then we're no longer a servant. We are Lord over the servants. Don't you think that young man got his head straight? I bet he did. Now the elder, verse, verse 25, Now this elder son was in the field, and as he came drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother has come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. That is so typical of a lot of church people. Angry. Now you listen to me. There have been deathbed confessions made to Jesus. For salvation. Do you know that they're going to get the same inheritance as those who have served God all their life? Same inheritance. Because we're all joint heirs with Jesus. And Jesus taught that parable about the guy goes out in the morning, he's got a whole vineyard, goes out in the morning, hires workers, say, What's the pay? It's a penny a day. Okay, we'll go to work. So they gets about noon, realizes he ain't got enough. 
So he calls out some more guys. They said, what's the pay? Penny a day. Okay, we'll go out. Late in the afternoon, some more guys show up. You still got work? Yeah, we got plenty of work. What's the pay? Penny a day. So the guys that got there at 6 o'clock in the morning come back complaining. We want more than a penny. Why? Because you, these guys came in late this afternoon. We saw them come in. You gave them the same amount of pay as you did us. And we've been working all day long. And, and Jesus said, the guy said, what did you agree to? A penny. Here's your penny. And what that is, that, that, that may not be fair as far as the union is concerned or as far as the Department of Labor is concerned, but with God, everybody is equal. We're all equal in that we are all sinners. Therefore, we are all equal in that we receive the one inheritance. The whole thing. Um, verse... Old verse 30. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatty calf. He said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. And that's just God. And I know there's some people that live a better life live a higher lifestyle, have been serving God for years. But I don't think I'd got the heart in me to hold it against somebody who waited until their last hour to give their life to the Lord. I, I tell everybody, everybody that comes to visit this place, I take them up in that room up there and I show them Steve's picture and I say, let me tell you about this man. He was the most lost, wicked man that I personally ever knew. And finally, finally gave his life to the Lord and I could see it in him. He asked me one day, is there something around here I can do? And I said, I don't know. Let me think about it. I woke up one day and had that room in my mind. Had no idea what I was going to do with it. And I said, Steve, come over here. I got something for you. He come over and he built that room. And he said, what are you going to do with it? I said, I don't have an idea. Twice a week, I do a broadcast that goes all over the world. The other two days, I'm usually up there doing my study so my kids and grandkids leave me alone. And there's more that comes out of that room here than probably any other place. He wanted to do one thing for God. And he did that room. And he being dead yet speaketh. Okay? So... Whether you're great or small, do a lot or do a little, it doesn't matter. You do it for God's kingdom. Everybody's the same. You're, we're sons, amen? John 1, turn there. I ain't heard the bell ring yet, so I'm going to keep talking until somebody rings my bell. John chapter 1, verse 11. He came into his own... And his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. Which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I'll tell you another story right out of the Bible. Here's Joseph who was done dirty by his own brothers. They were going to kill him, but then they sold him into slavery. And he ends up in slavery, ends up in prison, but then he ends up being basically king over the entire world. And when his brothers show up, two years after the famine begins, because they don't have any food, his brothers show up, and what does Joseph do for them? Does he kill them? No. Does he put them in slavery? No. He had a right to. And he had the power to do it. But what did he do? He fed them. And then he brought them down to Egypt. He said, go tell daddy to come down here. His son's waiting on him. He treated them with love because he loved his brothers. Somebody say amen. And he said, everything that I've got is yours. Praise God is right. So we've already got Jesus who was the firstborn of many brethren. And he, because of his love for us, is going to share with us 
everything that he's got, and he's the only one that deserved it. We didn't, but he did, and he deserved it. Father, you're a good God. The world doesn't understand this. The world wants to put everybody in classes. The world wants to put everybody on different levels and wants to put some people down and keep them down. But Father, you want to raise everybody up. You want, to, you want to make rich and poor, black and white, man and woman, great and nothing. You want to make them all the same through Jesus Christ, who he alone deserves the inheritance. And Father, we pray, dear God, your blessing on your word. Open up our eyes. Help us to see, Father, what it is we need to see. Help us, dear God, especially this time of year, to stop judging everybody we meet and start loving them the way Jesus loved us when we met him, who had pity on us and compassion on us and cared about us. Father, I pray for the man that served my food Friday who admitted he was a sodomite. And I pray, dear God, that you would bless that man. Lead him, Father, out of his lifestyle. Lead him to you. Save him. Save him. Because he's a sinner just like we are. Father, help us to love people. Love them the way Jesus did. Honor your word. Bless it in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen.